Welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoy. Mr. Winslow accused my mother of stealing his dead wife's jewelry. I explained it was impossible. He was welcome to search the tiny apartment I shared with my mother and aunt. He could look wherever he wanted. We share a tiny space, I said. We barely have enough room for our clothes. I don't even know where she would hide the jewelry. I was worried he, we would lose him as a client, which would suck because cleaning his house was basically the majority of our rent check. But a week later, he found the pearl necklace. It had somehow traveled down to his basement. I'm still missing the gold bangle though, he said, and some earrings. I told him I was sorry, but I had no idea. If my mom or aunt found it on their next clean, I promised they would let him know right away. He hummed and hawed. There might have been a week where he hired a different maid service, but eventually he called back, asking if he could hire all three of us on site again. I thanked him profusely. I told him we'd keep an eye out for the missing valuables. On our drive over, I had my mom and aunt practice the apology we would give him in English. Even though we didn't steal anything, I explained we should still say sorry. Why? My aunt asked. That's so stupid. Everyone apologizes for everything in Canada. Just trust me, he will want it. We need the work, my mom said. For a second, my aunt revved up to say something else, but then let it go. We did need the work. We arrived. Mr. Winslow was on a phone call, watching his two large golden doodles play in the front yard. He waved, then gestured to the front door. My mom and aunt gave small bows and carried their cleaning supplies inside. Before I could enter, I, he put the phone behind his ear and approached me. Ida, hi, good to see you again. Listen, don't worry about the jewelry. Water under the bridge. Hey, I'm leaving in an hour or so and I won't be back until late tonight. I'm wondering if you'd be interested in dog sitting? We've been around Toto and Kipper. What do you think? I'd really appreciate the help. I never liked the way he looked at me. It was always too close and it lingered for too long. My aunt may have been right in that he hired us back just to see me again, but I ignored the thought. And don't worry, I can cover your cab back. My usual walker is just out on holiday. You can help yourself to whatever is in the fridge. How does 600 sound? I looked at his house and imagined if I would be comfortable there, alone at night. I'll make it 700. I know it's last minute. I just hate leaving them alone. Plus, Toto has his medicine. He would do me a real solid. My apron needed adjusting, so I put down my bucket. I focused on the polyester knot, keeping my gaze away from his. I really didn't want to be doing this, but my aunt would call me stupid for refusing easy money. And frankly, so would I. I had plans, but I'm willing to give them up, I said with a straight face. 800, and it's a done deal. He paused for a second, observing me scrupulously. Then he found his usual smarmy half-smile. You're a lifesaver, you know that? An angel. His hand gripped my shoulder, then patted it twice. Both my mom and aunt were pleased about the extra cash. They said I deserved to make extra for all the bookkeeping I do. But they also both voiced their concerns for safety. They said they could stay with me if I wanted. Safety? Mame, I'm just watching two dogs. My mom wiped a caked red stain off his counter, an old wine spill. Yes, but so late in his house, you're not worried he might, I don't know. Might what? Exploit me? I met his groundskeeper once, another immigrant contractor, except the groundskeeper was being paid far less because he never properly negotiated. Mr. Winslow was certainly capable of exploiting people when he wanted to, and I'm sure he would try the same on my family. But I was different. I had gone to school in Banover, and I knew the little maneuvers played by the so-called progressive people in North America. And Winslow knew it too. 
He didn't realize the Canadian raised daughter organized her mom's cleaning service or that she would show up on the first day as a statement. That statement being, you can't get away with mistreating these old Brazilian women, and you certainly can't swindle him out of going rates in his neighborhood. I'm on to you. I had asserted myself with this Mr. Winslow and felt confident that I could stand my ground if he tried any bullshit. My may, I'm not worried about him, really I'm not. He's a pushover. 6 p.m. rolled around. It was just me and the Golden Doodles. My mom and aunt were back at home, watching low res soaps on a MacBook. But they said if I encountered anything strange, a sound, a smell, an unexpected car in the driveway, to give them a call right away. I may, it's two dogs. I'll be fine. Just keep your phone close, Ida. Your auntie has sensed things in that house, unpleasant things. I forget to mention my aunt thinks of herself as an amateur medium. In the village she grew up in, she claimed she could sometimes see people who were recently deceased. But I never really believed her, mostly because it was also my auntie's idea to charge families who wanted to forward messages to the very same people who were recently deceased. Okay, Mame, whatever you say. I'll phone you if I get scared. That house has a history, Ida. You could feel it in the walls, the outside too. It sure does. A history of being owned by a wealthy prick. The sun slinked below, over the horizon like a dying lantern. It got dark much faster than I expected. I kept all the lights on and played with the dogs a bit, trying to encourage them to try to piss on the shag rug. Neither did. They mostly wanted naps. I tried napping for a bit too, but the leather couch felt like it was made of rock. I just couldn't get comfortable. Eventually, I made myself dinner, some pasta that had been bought from Whole Foods, and ate it while scrolling on my phone. I was just about done, ready to take my dirty plate in the sink when I first heard it. The first explosion. It came from the basement. A vibrating kapow that rattled the windows and chandelier on my floor. It sounded like someone had set off a cherry bomb. What the hell? I turned to the dogs who were just as scared as I was. They came whimpering with tails between their legs. Could a pipe have burst or something? I looked at the basement door an area we were not instructed to clean, and then heard another explosion. Vases shook. A painting went tilted. It sounded louder, like a full-grade firework. I had lived in Rio de Janeiro by Priana Beach, where they often launched celebratory fireworks. This was just as deafening. I didn't want to go down to the basement. In fact, I sat by the front door. Both dogs huddled around me. Twenty minutes passed. It had been quiet. Out of pride, I refused to call my mom. I didn't want to admit I was scared. Instead, I spent the time going through all the rational answers in my head that could explain away the noise. Plumbing, terrorism, teen pranks, hot springs. There were hot springs all over West Van. Obviously, some kind of pent-up geyser had laid dormant for a while, and it was now suddenly unleashing a ton of energy below Mr. Winslow's house. To distract myself, I wikipedia the history of West Banover and satisfied this theory. During the 1850s gold rush, West Banover saw rapid settlement as a mining town. The proliferation of mine shafts soon led to a discovery of underground hot springs. Mayfield Briggs LTD which was the first company to seize the opportunity as a tourist attraction. That's all it was, a hot spring releasing a buildup of pressure. Then a third explosion came. It was so loud and violent that the door to the basement flew open. I fell to the ground and covered my head as several books went flying off nearby shelves. The dogs yipped and barked like crazy. They stood in front of me, guarding against an unseen force. A voice shrieked from the basement. It yelled help. Two times. Rivets shot through my hands and knees. I was frozen to the floor. It yelled please at the top of its lungs. 
It had the high-pitched desperation of someone whose life was about to end. I raised my head and listened closely to hear haggard, dusty coughing. It sounded like an old man's cough. It echoed through the basement and into the living room. Between coughs, the man continued to plead for his life. It yelled help another time. I had no idea who it could be or how he got down there. Before I could think, one of the dogs shot past me, bolting down the basement steps, barking ferociously. Kipper, I yelled. I tried to grab the loose leash, but I could only hold the collar of his sibling. Kipper, come back here. Hello? The voice from below seemed to recognize my presence. Please, you've got to help. I was now upright, breathing as fast as Toto was panting. I tied Toto to the thick rails on the stairs. I had to save the other dog. Instinctually, I grabbed my phone, slipped an AirPod in one ear, and dialed my mother without even looking at the screen. May, there's something terrible is happening. My mother was suitably confused, even more so when she heard the screaming of the man downstairs as his voice echoed in the living room. It was a cry of immense, awful pain. After two slower, more detailed explanations of what I just heard, my mother told me to call the fire department. Poke your head through the basement, see what's happening, then call the fire department. That made sense to me. I inched my way to the basement entrance and tried to see past the doorway. It was complete darkness. There was no light switch. I turned the torch on my phone, and my aunt's voice came blaring. Get out of there, Ida. I am telling you there is darkness in that house. As I illuminated the dusty wooden stairs, I saw that they only led only to more pitch black. Yup, plenty of darkness here. There was some phone rustling. My mother came back on. What is it? What did you see? Don't encourage her. Get her to leave, my auntie yelled in the background. I told them to pipe down because I could suddenly hear the gentle whimpering at the base of the stairs. The dog sounded close. Kipper, come. This way. Follow my voice. I went down a few steps further, expecting the basement floor to appear any second, but there were only more wooden steps. How long was this staircase? Kipper? There was a flat, cold wall on my left, and no guardrail to speak of. I stepped down each step very carefully to maintain my balance, sliding my hand along the wall. Then the wall disappeared. I flew forward. I woke up lying face first on rocky floor. My phone was cracked next to me. My mother was crying in my ear. Ida, Ida. Oh my god, Ida. I looked up to see I was not at the bottom of someone's basement. There were lights all above me, lanterns. They were illuminating a cavernous, rocky chamber that led to many tunnels with train tracks and wooden carts. I was in the opening of a massive underground mine. I coughed and gave out a weak, what? Ida, is that you? Are you? My mom's voice faded. Before I could reply, I saw the crooked form of a man in tan coveralls, shaking the immobile body of another person in coveralls next to him. In fact, there was a small row of half a dozen miners all slumped against the blasted rock wall. There were bits of granite, wood, rope, and what looked like entrails splattered all throughout. It's the end of part one.